maybe I can just briefly, briefly uh, start this uh, this presentation by inviting Christoph. <laughs> He's supposed to be the one who, who will start, and then we will change order. But thank you very much for for everyone who to join today. Hope you can uh, enjoy our presentation today. Thank you, Stravko, and let me follow up by hoping that you can hear me well. Um, so I'm joining you today from, from Zurich. Um, let's start this. So it is my great pleasure to introduce you all with this module overture to architectural cognition and practice, a module that comes relatively late to the table within Future Cities Lab Global, but that builds upon a number of activities that we'll also introduce today and that I hope you will find interesting. This presentation is given by the three principal investigators of the module, by myself, Christoph Fölscher, by Zdravko Trivic, and also Panos Malbros will be joining us, I'm assuming is joining us from Paris this morning. So what are we trying to illustrate with, this, with these images here? On the left-hand side, you see a shopping mall. On the middle, you see maybe an office building. And on the right-hand side, you see the interior of a, uh, of a hospital ward. And all of these are spaces in which people interact in which people spend time for various durations and we can ask how do they behave how do they experience these spaces how do they feel what is their impact on their well-being and the immediate understanding is that these buildings these architectural spaces they have an impact on people and therefore we can ask about the relation of humans and buildings next slide please and a lot of research in environmental psychology, in architectural psychology, in the healthcare domain, et cetera, has been done over the past decades, and our teams have contributed to some of that research. But a lot of that understanding sits in silos in academia. And one of our real aims is to break this open and translate it into reasonable input for design and society. Next slide, please. Excellent. Um, so as I already said, we want to talk about the relation between people or users of buildings and the built environment as the spaces in which people live. Here are two additional examples. We've done a lot of research over the past decade in the Seattle Public Library, a very famous building that has many architectural merits, but also a building that turns out to be often hard to navigate and where people find it difficult to actually engage in the activities that they would find uh, reasonable and supportive. Um, on any given day. Similarly, we can see uh, a big intention in terms of engaging users, engaging people, attracting activity, attracting behaviors, and positively impacting the experience of a space and people's emotional response, clearly, in cases such as the jewel on Changi Airport, which does not support the direct immediate function of getting people into airplanes or out of them again, which would be a navigational issue mostly, but it is about entertainment. It is about leisure. It is about engaging people to spend time in a space and have a positive experience of it. Next slide, please. And this brings us already to an important triangle in the way we think about space and the role of users and the role of architects. At the heart of our research clearly are people and people uh, come in as the users of buildings, the people who live and use buildings, who experience buildings. But there's also designers, there's architects, there's city planners. They design buildings, they design neighborhoods. And one of their roles is to anticipate how people will behave and how people will respond to these environments. What we've collected here are a couple of examples that have um, clearly differentiated impact on people, right? One example. Uh, being the uh, Ville Radieuse on the top right, which looks amazing and planned, but has serious concerns when you talk about people's experience living in such a space. The other examples are open spaces from, from various contexts. And if we look at these spaces, we see that some of them work better, some of them maybe work less good. And it is an aim for our research and also our translational efforts with with partners in industry and agencies to better understand what are the design features that foster or fail to foster a positive experience of people in such spaces. The next slide, please. And to look at this maybe a bit more systematically, um, what we're really interested in is adding a scientific component here by 
bringing architectural cognition to the table. What can architectural cognition provide? It starts out with trying to understand people and users in buildings and their relation to the built environment. And a lot of the foundational research that we have already engaged in and continue to engage in uh, lies in that relationship. But also architectural cognition aims to inform designers and other stakeholders and decision makers in terms of impacting the built environment. And this is where then reflective and translational research will come into play. I would like to highlight that these aims of our research are linked with sustainable development goals number three, nine, and 11. And I'm sure there will be further relations to be found. So this approach that we foster, this human-centered, evidence-based, scientifically driven um, support of design and decision-making is couched in a larger discourse of sustainability and in the aim to improve people's life over the long term. The next slide, please. And while this clearly sounds nice and dandy, there's a number of problems that we are facing, both in our research and also in our interactions with practitioners, and we have to define responses on how to act on this. There clearly is already a plethora of guidelines and designers are not wait waiting for behavioral scientists to come in and make their life even more complex. It's also the case very clearly in our research with designers that design intention and the realization of those intentions do not always align. There's clearly a challenge with interdisciplinary conversation as it involves understanding discipline specific voices and a lot of translational elements. And the big question then is, how do we integrate quantitative and qualitative perspectives that different stakeholders bring to the table? And clearly, the responses have to be somewhere along the lines of the following. We have to collate and synthesize what's already out there. We have to continue to conduct empirical research and site-specific case studies. We have to harness an interdisciplinary team, and we have to collaborate across fields and industries, and we'll show later how that works out. And we clearly have to utilize, um, define a bridging language to share our perspectives. Next slide, please. This brings us to the main aims of our module. First of all, we want to increase our understanding of person environment interactions. This includes cognition, it includes decision making and experience of spaces by diverse societal groups. It could be older people, younger people, people with special needs, different socioeconomic strata. Second, we aim to improve the design of buildings and urban districts by examining how and how well designers consider users, how we can apply findings and methods of spatial cognitive science in the design process. And third, we hope to equip design teams, planners, designers, authorities, stakeholders, with knowledge and tools to anticipate the complexity of human behavior. Next slide, please. And this already is the three fundamental building blocks of our research, namely fundamental research, reflective research, and translational research. Next slide, please. There are a number of interfaces and methodological considerations when you bring together cognitive science and architectural design to fields that might appear on the surface to be really opposing forces, cognitive science, very empirically driven, an analytic discipline, architectural design, solution oriented, also heavy on theory, but strong synthetic emphasis. Bringing that together is far from trivial. So cognitive science tells a lot about user needs and abilities, experiential factors, rigorous behavioral evaluation is available to capture how humans operate. At the other end in architectural design, the emphasis will be on design variation, will be on application to case studies, thinking in cases rather than just principles, and looking at the practical challenges and problematics that arise. Next slide, please. Let me now try to couch this a little bit in a timeline because we've been in Singapore for quite a while. Actually, this is the moment where I have to thank both Gerhard Schmidt and Kees Christianse for inviting me and my team to join Future Cities Laboratory about a decade ago. We came late to the table in terms of Future Cities Lab 1 because I only joined ETH in 2013, but we were part of forming uh, the cognition research in Future Cities Lab 2, have done several uh, applied smaller projects like the L2NIC on pedestrian comfort with a number of partners across Singapore engaged in smaller, more foundational research projects like the NICE project that Panos has been leading and I think that we will hear about a little bit. And now we're part of Future Cities Lab Global until 2025, but we've already started 
additional activities like the BFIT project together with uh, colleagues from Future Health Technologies. And since we are coming late to the table and we do have doctoral students, some of those doctoral student projects will reach out beyond 2025 anyway, which gives us additional incentive to continue what we're doing in this module and develop it further. Next slide. How do we do we'll go about this? I will not have the time here to introduce everybody in the team. So I'll just state that it's a mix of behavior scientists, cognitive scientists, computer scientists, and lots of architecture. The next slide. Similarly, we have built a, a team of support with architecture and computer science and geography professors from within ETH, from Singapore-based universities, but also partners from around the world that help shape this research in the past and in the future. The next slide, please. Let me also, before handing over to uh, the next speaker, mention that all of this research going outside of the academic bubble is only possible if you bring in partners, partners from industry like Zaha Hadid, UN Studio and ECOM, local agencies like the LTA and the Urban Redevelopment Agency. We work together in various fa uh, fashions with partners from London like Heatherwick Studio. We work with academic partners within the, within the uh, environment here at CREATE, like CNIS, where Thanos is now located and also with Semantic Urban Elements and Dense and Green to highlight two of the collaborative modules within Future Cities uh, Laboratory Global. And clearly what we do is we try to operate in those evidence-based collaborations between experts from scientific and applied fields. And it is really this outreach that defines what we try to achieve and has been extremely helpful as a reality check for defining what we do next. Next slide, please. Here, I can hand over to Panos because it's now time to talk a bit more about fundamental research. Panos, the floor is yours. Thank you, Christoph. Hi, everyone. So in our module, we work on three main axes of fundamental research, where we're trying to increase our understanding of person-environment interactions. So we're looking at the cognition, the decision-making, but also, as Christoph was saying, the experience of different spaces. Um, from different groups of society, different groups of demographics. And we have a few examples to illustrate this. Second, um, in our effort to un understand how this knowledge can translate into design, we engage in reflective research. So we, we're trying to improve the design by looking at how the designers understand users, uh, what they do and do not understand, and how we can bring findings from science, how we can bring methodologies from different from the different techniques that we use into the design process itself. This uh, gets us to our uh, third and last axis, which is really the translational research, which is to produce new tools, new pedagogical instruments, new simulation tools, and other um, methodologies that can help designers independently uh, engage in more de deeply human-centered design. Next. So I will start by giving you a few examples of our fundamental research, which, as we've said, it's uh, in this uh, uh, triangle of architectural cognition focuses on how people interact with different buildings. And here in buildings, we're not looking at the individual building uh, only, but we're also looking at the neighborhood scale, the streetscapes, the, the broad uh, urban environment, and the, the, the forces that uh, develop it, both the architects, the designers, the stakeholders, the decision makers. Next. So our key focus here is how people use and how they live and experience in different uh, buildings and uh, around buildings on the streetscape. Um, what we do know at the moment of human environment relationships and what we should be knowing. So trying to push forward the development of new theories, providing empirical data around uh, existing theories or uh, advancing our uh, fundamental knowledge. And next slide. We do this through uh, a range of different methods. So we have uh, behavioral experiments that combine eye tracking, psychophysiological methods. We, we will illustrate this uh, with a few examples. Sometimes we focus specifically on wayfinding. So asking people to go from one place to the next and see how exactly they go there. And other times we look at different types of behaviors, more the kind of behavior that you do in everyday life when you're going to 
the market, where you're going to the, the hawker center, or how do you work inside an office uh, or a, a workplace? Based on the findings from these type of studies, we develop agent-based simulations and we validate them again against new behavioral and uh, data. And we generally do this in case studies that allow us to know deeply how a building or a neighborhood was developed to be able to talk to the stakeholders, the designers, um, and conduct a series of studies over several years to, in a way, replicate our own data for different studies. Next. So we will start um, these few examples of our fundamental research, um, looking on how we interact with spaces, whether as occupants or residents and visitors. So some of our fundamental research, but not all, takes place indoors. For example, in this uh, study at the Zurich University Hospital, our team looked at how the special layout of an emergency department, um, what you see here on the left, uh, might improve um, healthcare performance. So Michal Gathmurad and Leonel and Christoph and other colleagues um, used a novel um, type of sensor based on Bluetooth that allows us to collect precise data about the location of people and their interactions without compromising privacy, which we know is critical in several settings, especially in healthcare. So with that, we were able to look on how um, medical staff, so doctors and uh, nurses interact with each other, but also how and when they interact with uh, patients and how they uh, and, and when they interact with visitors in, in such a, an emergency department, which is what you see on this heat map. And based on this, uh, we're trying to understand how these interactions face to face can be helpful or uh, provide a distraction and how overall we can um, link the, the layout of a, of a medical uh, of a medical space and emergency department with uh, healthcare perform uh, performance overall. This work is continuing, so we look forward to sharing more with you in the coming months. Next. Now it's time to take you to a few case studies that uh, look in outdoor environments, the, the streetscape that uh, uh, we all walk through in our everyday life. So we recently completed a project called NICE, or the Neuroscientific Investigation of Crowding and Environmental Psychology, which was a large collaboration between a uh, few seeds laboratory and NTU and NUS and ETH in Zurich. And we were trying to understand how the aesthetic quality of streetscapes, so the, the quality of the buildings, the materials, whether there is greenery, in conjunction with the amount of other pedestrians walking around us, influence our psychological experience and our desire to explore, our desire to be on a specific street. So to do this, we created a new database from 480 videos of walking in 30 different cities across the world in 20 countries. And then we conducted three consecutive experiments, a large online study, a lab study that you, you see on this uh, uh, slide, as well as a field experiment in Singapore. So we measured people's uh, self-reported emotions and also their motivation, so their willingness to visit the, a specific location but also their visual attention using eye tracking and their brain activity using EEG. Uh, in a nutshell, what we find is that beautiful streetscapes and high aesthetic quality environments matter. As you can see on the bottom right, um, with more crowding, people feel more excited, arousal goes up, but um, the, the, the balance, whether people have positive emotions is more influenced by whether an environment's uh, perceived as beautiful, um, and we also see an effect of crowding. So when we are talking about a beautiful uh, streetscape, more, more people usually lead to a decline of willingness to walk. But for those environments that are less aesthetically interesting, some amount of people, a moderate amount of crowding is beneficial. It makes these spaces more interesting, more inviting for people. So now we, we need to take these findings and bring them into the policymaking tables and policymaking discussions and also discuss them with designers to see what are the implications for their work. Next, staying on the realm of the streetscape and the neighborhood, uh, two more projects closer to you at the Value Lab in Singapore. So through a multi-sensory approach, a Stratco study of two high-density public housing neighborhoods in Singapore explored how older residents perceive and utilize their familiar outdoor setting. So this is about places they know well, their own homes and neighborhoods. The study combined surveys and naturalistic eye tracking experiments in the neighborhood, as well as in-depth post-walk interviews, which was the first attempt to use mobile eye tracking to empirically investigate senior adults' perceptions in outdoor real-world environments in Singapore. 
Eye tracking proved to be a fruitful approach to capture key issues pertinent to age-friendly design with capacities of revealing the facets of sensory experience beyond visual attention. So it provided overall an effective new means for documenting and articulating subjective, bodily, emotional, and symbolic encounters with familiar settings in an active and participatory manner. Next slide. So the key findings of this project reveal that while walking through public housing neighborhoods, older Singaporeans spend most of their time, 43%, looking at the ground. So looking downwards compared to looking on the edges. So left or right or the sky upwards. The result also indicated that visual tension towards the ground tends to increase with age, which makes sense because it could be driven by safety concerns, fear of falling, as well as the changes in body posture and motor abilities that typically occur with aging. However, we also think that the behavior, this behavior might also be the result of the lack of diversity of positive and interactive stimuli in some of the spaces of those neighborhoods, for instance, in void decks. As we expected, a stark difference was found in the sensor experience and the bodily engagement with the void deck spaces versus the wet market, which is a lot more rich in sensory terms and a lot more inviting through the presence of active edges, shops and stalls, but also the presence of people. Next. In another study, uh, Srav Petrovic looked, at, uh, looked further into the relationship between sensory richness, how interesting and inviting an environment is, and playfulness, and how they may affect cognitive health of older adults. So, as we said, the sensory environment refers to the environment's capacity to engage the user through all kinds of environmental stimuli, but playfulness here refers to the personality traits that enable people to derive joy from different kinds of activities. The hypothesis was that sensory environment and playfulness are interrelated mechanisms associated with reduced depressive symptoms and cognitive decline in older age. The results of our survey and the path analysis did not find a direct positive relationship between sensory environment and playfulness than as to related factors, but clearly suggest that the sensory environment and playfulness both improve cognitive health of older, adult, older adults, mediated by an increased neighborhood cohesion, sense at home, decreased loneliness and depression, both at the neighborhood level and at the individual level. Next. So this is studies we've already completed and we have lots of interesting studies coming up. Um, some of them involve a comparative experiment when we try to understand uh, the, the discrepancy or the alignment between designers' intentions uh, for um, a new building and the user's actual activities in a simulated environment of the same type. So we will be looking at different complex environments, complex buildings, and trying to understand if designers' intentions and user behavior align. Second, we are engaged in uh, conducting uh, a thorough literature review of the field of architectural cognition as a domain of knowledge and trying to understand what linkages exist and what should be existing, should be developed further in the years to come. And uh, as Christoph mentioned already, there's a new project uh, called BFIT or Built Environment in Falls and Arthritis Study, which is a big collaboration between the Future Health Technologies, the Future Cities Lab, uh, the CNRS at CREATE, but also Sing Health, uh, NUS, and NTU, uh, where we will look at the relationship between the built environment and the psychosocial factors of mobility of, mobility, uh, of elderly people with arthritis and a high risk of falling. Next. And now we move over to Strafko and our second axis of research. Thank you very much, Panos. Uh, I will introduce the second pillar of our research, which is about uh, reflective assessment, uh, whereby the aim is to improve the design of buildings and urban districts by examining how and how well the designers consider users, how they consider the data about and from the users in their design process. So it's really about asking a question, how can findings and methods that we use in the spatial condition, uh, science really contribute to the design processes and creating better evidence-based designs. We, as designers, continuously try to anticipate how the users behave in the cases that we design. However, uh, this is not always easy, and sometimes we rely too much on our intuition and our past experiences to do so. In that process of anticipating how the people would behave and use the spaces that we design, 
uh, designers uh, come across various problems and then various challenges. Some of these challenges sometimes come from the uh, very nature of the design process or the problems that come within the, 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 the projects, such as the scale or the complexity in terms of spatial or programmatic uh, aspects of the project. Uh, some of the problems come from the very nature of collaboration, working in teams, there are conflicts, there, are, there is also lack of time to do proper research, there is a, sometimes a lack of understanding of the design brief, the design brief is not necessarily uh, uh, clear, and therefore the, 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 the problems arise. So the question really is, to what extent and how the methods and tools that we use in the architectural cognition can really help to overcome some of these challenges, and then to, to what extent really. So, let me reiterate the, the, the major question that we have in this, this pillar of research. It is really about how and how well the designers consider and anticipate user needs and behavior in the spaces that they're designed. How do ar architects uh, use different types of available evidence uh, about end users in the design process and to improve uh, the, the design outcomes that they are working on? And what kind of information or knowledge or even skills do they need to, to really uh, achieve that. So in, in order to understand and answer some of these questions, we use an array of methods and techniques. We start first with a critical review of existing tools and methods that we use in architectural cognition science. And uh, uh, we also look into how these particular tools are applicable and appreciated from the designer's point of view. So it's really quite important to understand how the designers see the, the, the usefulness of these tools within their, within, within their design process. Uh, recent developments in digitizing the, the architectural design process, uh, but also evaluating the designs and utilizing new non-novel technologies such as augmented or virtual reality really opened up a lot of uh, room for, for designing better designs, but also evaluating the designs before they're actually built. Uh, this, however, this perspective from, from the designer's point of view is uh, really critical uh, because it enables the application of these, uh, these tools in the industry, given the, the rising pressure to produce more, produce fast, and then not having enough time to really do a proper research. So to overcome some of these challenges, uh, we are also using different types of uh, methods from the more conventional interviews and surveys with, with all potential stakeholders in the design process to uh, maybe more design-centered and collaboration-oriented methods such as the design competitions or workshops. So. Uh, I, we can build up here on some of the earlier successful uh, employment of, of some of these methods, including the design competition in the uh, BFG New York office uh, several years ago by, by some of our team members, uh, whereby the idea was to bring in the students and practitioners to develop specific uh, designs that uh, uh, answer specific questions of the project at that time. Uh, and uh, the idea was to not only give an opportunity to, to get people to execute their work, but also come together through a series of workshops to uh, improve their designs, to expand their skills, and also to evaluate their designs before they, uh, they eventually potentially build them. Uh, in that sense, they would be uh, using various tools from the spatial analytics and space syntax to the different uh, VR or method reality experiments to also include various participants in the workshop as part of the design process. One of the examples I would like to share here are the secondments uh, with uh, our industry partners. Our PhD researcher, Eugene, uh, spent over a month last year in the UN studio in Amsterdam uh, to really understand the design processes that are going on within their uh, office. Uh, she conducted several interviews uh, and uh, also observed the design process and documented so that we can uh, follow up in the next, uh, next phases of the, the research. She has also conducted a workshop with uh, 
uh, about 20 participants, most of them uh, the designers from the, uh, the UN studio. Uh, and uh, she, she utilized the previously uh, developed cognition cards as a prop to uh, start up the discussion between the designers and researchers, but also to, uh, to evaluate whether such props are successful to, to, to start up the decision, to, to improve the decision making in the design process. Similar workshops have been, have been conducted also recently with the Hedwig Studio. Uh, London, uh, and, uh, when it comes to the upcoming research, we have actually already started working on understanding how uh, architectural offices globally are utilizing or considering the, the user uh, information in their design process. Our PhD researcher, Freyan, has already piloted a part of this uh, survey uh, in the FCO Global Symposium exhibition that happened over last year. Uh, and we are going to, to work on that further to uh, to enrich our knowledge of this matter. We will, of course, continue to evaluate uh, the existing tools and methods uh, to better understand the resources that designers can harness from the design process. And uh, finally, Apart from the uh, researchers' comments that the Eugene did, we are also hoping to uh, host the designers from different uh, industry partners in uh, our labs in both in Zurich and Singapore to uh, improve and to learn from them as researchers, but also to, to find where are those particular people's spots in their design process where they can uh, uh, improve their own, uh, their own design. I will hand over to, to Christoph now to talk about it. Thank you, Sarko. Exactly. Next slide, please. So let's pick this up for this third pillar, which of course is strongly related to the previous two pillars, translational research. Here the aim is to equip design teams with knowledge and tools to anticipate the complexity of human behavior. So we have three guiding questions here. One is, how do we create a common language for designers and researchers? What kinds of empirical evidence or scientific outputs are most suitable for practitioners? And how do we integrate cognitive and behavioral science methods into the design workflow? So it's about language, it's about the role of evidence, and it is about design workflows. This has a number of requirements in terms of translational research and provides various opportunities. One of that opportunity is to get involved fairly early in the design process and engage in early design phases, looking at the development of tools, looking at development of case studies with practitioners in the context of, for example, prototyping. One other element is to develop workflows and develop toolkits. And some of the examples in the reflective component directly go into the translational component here as well. The third is to develop teaching and training opportunities and materials. And this we see as also one of our aims and um, efforts in the, in the coming phase. And as much as I have been somewhat critical of guidelines in the introduction, we can contribute to guideline development where it is uh, useful. Next slide, please. Just very quickly, I would like to highlight Again, that the flashcard decks that we have developed over time to enable knowledge sharing, that they can be used in various contexts. Strafko showed the example of UN Studio. We have indeed uh, driven largely by Ruth Dalton from uh, University of Northumbria at Newcastle, uh, recently done a workshop with Heatherwick. And over time, there have been various uh, applications of this, both in the Singapore and international contexts. And also, not only with practitioners, but also in the student context. And uh, what we find is that both students and practitioners find these slide, these uh, card decks to be handy and useful. And they go in different directions, right? So the, the main publication here from Architectural Science Review highlights two decks, the Spatial Cognition Thinking Deck, which is more about sharing facts of spatial cognition in relation to the built environment. 
And there's a second deck of cards that is more towards the des for, towards design activities, maybe in studio, the architecture design strategies cards that look specifically at this matter of perspective taking of the need of the architect of the designer to anticipate what is the impact of their design intentions on users experience and behavior in the built environment. Next slide, please. Similarly, uh, a, a strand of teaching activities led by Michal Gadmorat, but also Raphael Bauer and Leonel and myself at ETH over the past few years has, especially in the context of office spaces and healthcare spaces, looked at how can we use simulation tools. Those can be analytic tools like traditional space syntax techniques, but can also be cognitively motivated agents. These, these very technology driven and always colorful and fancy looking tools, integrate them into the design uh, uh, teaching and uh, also into analytic seminars. And in this context, uh, Michal and, uh, and Raphael have, have developed the Design Mind Toolkit, which comes uh, in the form of, again, design thinking cards that help to understand where in the process these technical tools, spatial analysis, agent-based modeling, et cetera, might be most useful. This brings us already to the next slide, because this is the background in which this teaching happens. It is the COG arc um, environment or framework for simulating wayfinding by architecture in multi-level buildings. What does wayfinding by architecture refer to? It refers to the fact that architectural design, the structure of the built environment, strongly influences how people behave in space. This is an effort lit, uh, driven mostly, of course, by Michael Gadmorat, because this is a core of her PhD work, but also Lionel and especially Ruth Dalton have contributed very heavily to uh, these efforts. Next slide, please. In the interest of time, I'll, I'll keep the rest short. I want to only want to mention an ongoing project with, uh, with the LTA, the Integrated Wayfinding System Consultancy, where we have combined qualitative and quantitative data collection, doing deep dive interviews and user shadowing, observing people in neighborhoods to understand how people find their way in complex Singapore-based neighborhoods and use that as a background to then design uh, environment-mounted map, uh, map systems that help people navigate. And this is then founded in empirical research with eye tracking to look at how people in the laboratory and in the field interpret those maps when they try to find their way through interesting neighborhoods in Singapore. Next slide, please. I want to uh, wrap this up by talking about two um, directly teaching-oriented efforts at NUS. One is driven by Strafko. It's in the context of multi-sensory approach to aging-friendly design. And this elective course, City and Census, the students are invited to better understand how it is to be in neighborhoods in Singapore, especially also from the point of view of others, of older people, for example. And here, a strongly qualitative approach is taken with um, really experiencing the neighborhood doing phenomenological and situationist discourses, looking at ethnographic approaches to understanding how people feel in these spaces, what is the rhythm in which people move along in, this, in these estates and how that feels. And this, these experiences that the students make are then taken both into the design studio to help them come up with design variations that they deem meaningful in these kinds of environments, but also this this qualitative research then informs, and this is a link back from the translational to the foundational, informs new studies with eye tracking, bringing together empirical, quantitative, and very qualitative understanding with, uh, with visual attention studies, with eye tracking devices, et cetera, to help improve our foundational knowledge of such spaces and to enable design thinking and finding new solutions for HDBs and other relevant um, um, situations in Singapore. One more example is a design studio and teaching at NUS in 2022 that Panos has engaged in, uh, maybe a bit more technology and analytic tools heavy, um, where it's behavior observations and spatial network analysis. We have not mentioned space syntax very much in this talk, but a lot of our research and also a lot of our translational activities 
utilizes space syntax tools, um, engaging that to understand building usability by, for example, using visibility analysis modeling, both for outdoor spaces, but also for indoor spaces. This leads to iterative development for architectural and urban design variations and bringing things back to our strong interest in virtual reality simulation allows us for user testing in virtual reality. Next slide, please. Let me sum this translational research up by giving you three main directions of our upcoming um, translational research. The next slide should talk about workflow and toolkit development, looking at ongoing research about design processes that will be used to develop toolkits which integrate different forms of spatial analysis in order to better address the designer's needs at different stages of design. It also continues our development of pedagogical materials for the architectural cognition and user behavior that really need to impact our design students, but also reach out to practitioners. Um, we really want to engage in different formats, design studios, workshops with people from industry, and also linking those step-by-step, -step, for example, by having design ideas that come up in workshops with, with practitioners who have very little time, feed that into the student experience over the course of a whole semester in design studio, and then bring this in to another very targeted interaction with practitioners to further refine and exchange between student perspectives and practitioner perspectives. And last but not least, a lot of our research over the last 20 years has been about using virtual reality techniques to simulate and evaluate spatial environments. And here we're now aiming for a more fast-paced, agile approach that allows us to bring these virtual reality techniques into the design process in a much more targeted and short-term manner. Next slide, please. This sums up what we had to say about the three uh, pillars. And if you were to go to slide number 44, I believe that would be a very good final slide because it allows us to very briefly touch upon directions of future work and open questions. And uh, we distinguish here between the familiar and the unfamiliar layer. And when it comes to considerations of human cognition and behavior, there's very little of that in design practice. So there's this huge gap between academia and practice. Um, we do understand that ultra mixed use buildings pose an unprecedented level of complexity and we want to do more on those uh, specific ultra mixed use scenarios. And we identified already this need for pedagogical material. And then we have to branch out from there. We have to ask additional questions, right? What are the challenges preventing implementation? How can we integrate the methods and tools? What are the best case studies of the ultra mixed use building type and how effective are existing and prevalent materials that we hope to develop uh, over the course of the next two, two and a half years in this module. So there's a lot of open-ended exploration based on the uh, achievements that we have presented today. I will close it here. Thank you all very much and, uh, and invite questions and answers. Back to you, Fayan. Uh, thank you very much for the presentation. Thank you to all the speakers. Uh, we now take questions if there are any uh, from the room first, and then uh, one more from the room. Thank you everyone uh, for the really wonderful, uh, well put together presentation. Um, I, I, my, my research is kind of tangential as well in that I'll use some spatial analysis. Um, I had a question regarding temporality, and this is to all three of these speakers, um, because we have like excuse environments, especially in Singapore. Um, could you talk a little bit more about how you, um, sort of empirically understood, uh, or sought to track the temporality of user behavior? And I think I saw something in the off study of uh, the HDB. And um, also, if, if there was a way of, uh, I'm not too familiar with the cognitive experiments, but is there something that you could use to sort of understand people's uh, behavioral changes throughout days or weekends and weekdays? Thank you. Uh,
Yeah, maybe I can. I can maybe I mentioned uh, already. It's true. Uh, I was very much uh, intrigued by Hungarian papers with the analysis, uh, which is a kind of a social, uh, you know, methodology from the, the social sciences. It's about observation and then trying to understand different kinds of rhythms that, that happen in the place simply by observing and looking down. And it's, it's, it's something really, uh, relatively, relatively simple. But what I tried to do is to expand that into the human experience to try to also understand not only where people do what they do in different life types of places at different times of the day and the week, but also how they make their own experience, how do we get additional information that is a bit more empirical about their specific experience in terms of uh, the, the change of the visual attention or uh, you know involving other senses. So the idea was really to try to understand where these different rhythms come together in harmony and where they come together in clashes and therefore you know unlock particular spaces in the neighborhood where we can then work on what are the big spots or the hot spots that we normally call them to, to really intervene and then create a, a better design that doesn't necessarily mean that the spaces that are super harmonious are also doing well uh, but nevertheless, my study of sensory experience doesn't necessarily say that the richer, you know, sensory richer uh, environment is better than not. I mean, this is obviously proven with some of the studies that Panos mentioned in terms of the beauty of the environment or the crowdedness and how this kind of perceived, uh, you know, processing of information actually creates different uh, responses to people and. Uh, yeah, I might love certain place only in the morning and never again, right? And this is where, where the temporality comes in. But I think that the temporality can be understood in <laughs> many other other layers, uh, which might be a little bit more philosophical, I guess, as well. Uh, but it is really about the design process, which is also very, very dynamic, and uh, bringing in the specific tools and the principles and you know, and it has to happen at the right time. Otherwise, it's a kind of a lost or missed opportunity, given the very fast pace of how the, the design environment works. I mean, that's unfortunate. So we have to think about the, the time in that sense. So I, I hope I answered a bit of question. <laughs> maybe, maybe kind of send Crystal and Maybe I'll maybe I'll give a high level. Um addition to that well first of all thank you very much for the question i think it's it's very relevant and somewhat sits a bit squarely with a lot of the environmental and architectural psychology uh, research that i'm aware of um and thank you obviously Stravko, for for really putting this into the right uh, into the right perspective um and i think an answer on the temporality question when it comes to the users has, has to have this qualitative phenomenological um element in it because a lot of the empirical research is a snapshot is a snapshot of specific behaviors in a often idealized task context and uh, and i think what we become more and more to realize is that the empirical research that we do in more laboratory like settings has to com has to be complemented with this qualitative understanding of going in of doing deep dive interviews of 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 doing surveys um, with different target audiences and uh, and in some sense, right, different target audiences also design define their own temporality, right? So if you if you uh, ask the kids, the middle aged and the old about their experiences of space, you uh, you cut through time in a sense. But Panos, maybe you want to also add to this. Thank you, Christoph. Um, I fully agree. I think it's an important dimension to look at, and we know that environments look static uh, because the, the buildings don't really change from day to day, but they are actually, our experiences within them change a lot in interaction with the climate, the weather, um, as well as with other people. So these are things that we definitely should address, um, especially in places like Singapore, where small variations in, let's say, temperature might influence uh, our comfort outside whether we're willing to walk independently of the other factors. So we do need to have more complex uh, theoretical models, going back to our foundational research, but also um, 
design responses. So in engaging translation research, and I know our colleagues from um, Cooling Singapore a few years back have developed a comprehensive uh, set of tools, for instance, to address some of those issues around thermal comfort. So similarly, we want to engage in this kind of dialogue around topics of occupancy and use and um, in a dynamic setting. Back to you. Maybe I can add just one more thing. I think some of the studies previously also looked into the you know, unpredictability of uh, the, the life and therefore COVID and all the closures and the construction sites and so forth, which bring a certain change into the environment that then you know, needs to be addressed in a different way because it's experienced differently, right? So what Anders just mentioned were more on the kind of everyday <laughs> level kind of changes that happen just climate, but you know, we are also looking into more or could potentially look into to more uh, I wouldn't call it emergency, but at specific points in, in, in time when, when the you know changes are much more drastic. So thank you. Yeah, please. Uh, I have a question about the collaboration with the practitioners of the industry. Uh, so have you got any feedbacks from the designer's perspective on what are the biggest obstacles to integrate the recognition and analysis into a real project workflow? Is it because of a lack of uh, methodology or is it because of a lack of funding from the client? <laughs> yeah, so I just came back uh, last year. So actually during the interview with the designers, there are multiple major issues that we find. Uh, so one major issue designers usually point out is the different uh, pace of, uh, so the difference in pace between the design and research actually. So for example, in the design, which as architects or planners usually you know, it's super fast paced, pushed by the clients, etc. Well, for researchers, it is usually a long period of time kind of research to have a detailed and refined results, which their objectives might be different, although aiming at the same final game of benefiting the users, but designers are usually pushed by multiple deadlines, etc. And also, as they are facing different client, uh, client I would say, like for um, for the architects who are facing the actual commercial client or government clients, the client is also expecting less of the scientific results rather than the opposite, which are the scientific or research community uh, for the researchers. So this, uh, I would say this um, um, difference in pace is one of the big problems. And also given the uh, workload, etc., uh, for the architects, it is really hard for them to pick up a completely new set of skills, a completely new set of knowledge, etc., with their own um, workload, etc. So one of the conclusions that or one of the um, understanding that we made is that there is actually a better, there is actually a need of a better either a tool or workflow that facilitates the designers but also fits within the scientific needs of the researchers as well. Which is our company. Okay, thank you so much. Do you think the solution for that different phase would be to integrate different tools into the existing architecture? It's like what you're doing. Yeah, that, that would be, I, I would say that would be one of the ways, and many of the designers do have the interest to learn the new tools, but as I said, many of them, due to their workload and time spent being, which uh, learning new set of tools, etc., might be one way, but it might take more than expected. Like, might take the time that it's more than expected on their architects. So, an improved version of those tools, actually, or a better, let's say, a toolkit or a handbook, etc., that trains the designers on the different tools that um, benefits different stages of the design would be one way. One way to deal with this, maybe, and what we are trying to do is 
to introduce this within the educational setting. I mean, to be at the right pace with the current and even future development of technologies and tools and so forth, so to equip the students. But it sometimes happens that even by the time they actually reach to the point when they need to apply those skills, those skills might already be redundant. It will be in a really, really fast society where the, 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 the tools and especially you know, the digital tools really. Well, what you mentioned is very true. It's also the, you know, how much the practice and the academia is at par. Often, you are able to train people who are way ahead of the time. They explore the experience. But when they come out into practice, they see the case, they work in my brain, they will absorb and misuse those skills. And often, there is always a kind of a balance which is not there, which in a way results in that gap not really bridging. And it kind of the gap stays just that you're moving but the gap is not bridging. So it is you have to kind of uh, see how uh, I mean one possible way as you said is also to, to engage them at, in the process right? rather than just show them the output. Often that is where the issue starts. The practitioners think yeah all this is fine but what do I do? But if they are part of the journey of how we go about developing it, uh, and then we can also be that. That's the why I say obviously together, but never. Also, this uh, integration of research and designers, I, I, I feel that for architects, especially in the building um, industry, is uh, especially slower pace industry compared to let's say the other uh, like your know, UX design or product design which have a faster reflection like yeah reflection group or that you get fast results you get fast um, reflections from the actual users while well, body text like a project might last 10 years for the actual outcome so it's something that we need to as well So maybe again to give a high level feedback here, right? So I very much welcome the question. I'm very happy also that that you just jumped in and uh, and explained in much detail um, how the partners that we have experience uh, the challenges, and I believe that is representative of feedback that we also got from other industry partners over the years, right? And I, I do believe that time is an essential component here, right? So if you compare really digital design and architectural design or even city planning, the timelines are so vastly different. And, and in human computer interaction, which happens to be my, my original home field, right? You would always argue for doing user experiments at some stage in the design process with the actual designs, right? And in digital design, that works very well, and there's clear incentives and clear benefits, and it's a billion-dollar industry by now. Um, that same does not apply to architecture, and to some extent, maybe that also is not possible. And this is one reason why we more strongly now look into developing tools that help the designers get an approximation of user behaviors. Um, but I don't believe that any single tool will ever solve this because the agent-based modeling that, that we are uh, pushing um, has limitations. The ethnographic methods have limitations. The going into the field and observing uh, related case studies in detail with eye tracking and maybe a virtual reality replica, et cetera, none of that answers the whole deck of questions. My increased belief is that you always have to bring together two or more of these techniques to get an in-depth understanding and then follow that through several stages of the design process. And that's the big challenge that we are facing right now. Uh, over time, we have uh, one more question. Thank you to our speakers. Thank you for coming. Uh, 
if there are contact details, if you would like to contact us. Otherwise, thank you very much. Thank you, everyone. Thank you.